This is my puppet script to move this side of the room to the other side of the room. We, we really should that would have saved some time. All right, everyone sitting comfortably and can see enough of the slide or as much of the slide as they want to see. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about uh, sysops. It sounds like a lot of you are kind of sysops al or devops already. You guys do some development and some systems, but I'm gonna try to convince you if you're not already convinced that uh, knowing a lot about systems and infrastructure will make you a better developer. So um, some things you should know as a developer about infrastructure. And uh, just a quick question, how many people are just developing modules and things like that, themes? How many are, are deploying and maintaining entire Drupal sites? Yeah, that's a lot of you. So th this, uh, a lot of this stuff will hit home. You wanna know where your code is going to live. You're gonna know, want to know what resources it's gonna need, uh, memory, bandwidth, disk, things like that. You're gonna want to know how it gets deployed. Is this getting deployed with a Drush script, uh, Puppet script? Is it uh, something you manually have to do? Is it some uh, hidden Perl script in a directory somewhere that you don't know? And how does it get maintained? How is it gonna be upgraded? Who's going to upgrade it? Are you responsible for upgrading? Is it going to automatically upgrade from a particular Git branch when you update that Git branch? It would be good to know that before you commit to that Git branch. In other words, you need to know about operations, or ops for short. So knowing the system in which your code lives can make you write better code. Uh, if you know something about the bandwidth situation, you'll know if your code needs to deal with uh, a lot of latency, low bandwidth. Uh, are you on a, a cluster of VMs behind a big load balancer with a big fat pipe? Maybe you can code a little differently. Understanding those issues will help. What's the storage situation? Do you have all of your disk storage on a NFS share over a slow link to Kansas City? It would be good to know that before you write your code and set up your assets. Uh, how slow is it really going to be? Do you have a way to know how slow it's going to be? Do you have a way to measure how slow it is? Uh, can you use a content delivery network? Can you cache it? Is memcache available? Is uh, a key value store like Redis available? Can you store it on a, a disk cache? What is the system that your code's gonna live? What does it look like? And what can you do with it? Knowing the system in your, which your uh, code runs means you can plan. So uh, what version of PHP is on that system? Uh, what version of Drupal core is on that system? What libraries are available? Are you using a system library for graphics manipulation? Do you know if the correct version is on that system? What tools are available? Are they using Drush or is it all manual? Do they have uh, rsync, other kind of tools that you might need to, to maintain your code? Uh, and yeah, uh, PHP 5.2, it's out there. Uh, is your code able to gracefully handle a situation where it's on a server with PHP 5.2? So uh, it, there are often reasons for old libraries, old systems, old uh, PHP, and understanding the system side of things, understanding why those things are in place will help you deal with that situation. Uh, knowing when things get upgraded, why they get why they get upgraded and how they get upgraded. For instance, uh, PHP 5.2 might be there because some core application needs it and they cannot upgrade because it's a shared environment. Understanding that will uh, give you a lot more understanding of what's going on on the system side and make the systems admins a little more sympathetic to you when you come begging at their door to upgrade to 5.3. Uh, so when are they going to upgrade it? Understanding that cycle, understanding when to expect an upgrade will help you plan ahead. Uh, understanding things like uh, security updates. Sometimes things get upgraded uh, you know, tonight at midnight because there's a security hole that was just found in uh, Mod Whiskey. Does that affect you? If you don't understand systems, you don't know. So understanding what's going on the system side will help you plan ahead for that. Uh, the other thing that uh, knowing the system helps you do is it means you can develop and test your code safely. So how many people have a dedicated dev environment that they can develop their code in? How many have a, a dedicated test environment? How many people's uh, dev and test environments are just their laptop? Yeah, there's a, there's a couple. 
So understanding uh, systems will help you create those and maintain those dev environments, not just a box that has a LAMP stack on it that you can install Drupal, but an actual environment that completely mirrors what the production environment's gonna look like. Because if it's different from production, you can test all you want, but you don't know what's gonna happen when it actually goes into production. So the fastest way to know infrastructure and get familiar with system and tasks is to build some infrastructure. And virtual machines make this very, very easy. Uh, there are tools that are free and easy to use on all platforms. Uh, VirtualBox and Vagrant are the uh, ones that I use. Vagrant is a, sort of a front-end framework for uh, VirtualBox. It allows you to script and automate creation of virtual machines in your management. Uh, but there are VMware, Parallels, and, and other systems that you can use. And there are configuration management tools. Uh, how many people are familiar with Puppet, Chef, CF Engine, there are a lot of them out there. And if you're working on a system where you have sysadmins maintaining your servers, uh, find out what they use. Uh, learn those tools. If you understand Puppet, you can apply those same rules to your production environment that the operations guys are applying to the production environment. You can create a set of VMs that exactly mirror production and when production uh, uh, production settings or libraries change, you can easily change those on your virtual machines. If you're not deploying to a site and you don't have sysadmin people to talk to, learning these tools is very useful anyway because it will help you understand how systems operate, how things work in the real world. So even if you're just developing a module, I really recommend you looking into Chef and Puppet. So a uh, great thing about virtual machines, they are disposable. Uh, the other great thing is you can build machines that exactly replicate your production environment. You can actually talk to your sysadmins and get the same scripts that they use and apply them to your, your virtual machines. And uh, you can make lots of boxes. Make a test box, make a dev box, make an AB test box, make an A test box and a B test box. Make, uh, you know, make dozens and dozens of boxes. And if you've ever in frustration wanted to go into your main server and do a rm-rf slash uh, virtual machines are the way to do that. You can uh, destroy, destroy them all. So um, I hope that I've started to convince you that knowing systems is a good thing. It sounds like most of you were already at least halfway there. So go forth and use your new sysadmin superpowers to develop better code. And with that, I'm going to uh, turn it over, over to Rudy. All right, so be a DevOp. How to get ready for deployment. Uh, there's a few things to know. Um, are you releasing too frequently or not frequently enough? Um, there's a careful balance to maintain there. Um, knowing when it is time to actually deploy your changes to production is, is important. And having a simple, easy to follow deployment process uh, helps keep everyone happy. And if you're a DevOp, it keep, just keeps you happy. Um, your dev side can rest easy, you know, knowing updates have been tested before they go out, if you have a good deployment process. Um, your ops side can rest easy, knowing there's a simple deployment process in place. Uh, there's not a lot of things that could go wrong when your ops guy is deploying your code. Uh, you don't want to light your infrastructure on fire. Uh, so it is important to know your upgrade path and the dependencies that may come into play during your release. Um, so reduce your moving parts. Um, that's just a general, you know, less is more in this sense. Um, to make things easier doing deployments, uh, try and decouple as much as possible. Um, you know, avoid depending on things just to depend on them. Uh, sometimes this is inevitable because you need to depend on something. But, um, you know, understand, you know, whether it's a Drupal module depending on other modules or library versions or on a lower level, things like package dependencies at the OS level, things like uh, CentOS 5, uh, comes bundled with PHP 5.1.6, I believe. Um, it's very old. Uh, so how do you upgrade that separate from having to upgrade to CentOS 6? Um, so an example of that would be like using an external like third-party package repository that has uh, PHP 5.3. Uh, the IUS repository has this. Uh, it lets you upgrade within CentOS 5 to PHP 5.3, uh, you know, test your code without having to actually upgrade to CentOS 6. Then when you're ready to upgrade to CentOS 6, 
you can do that separate from upgrading PHP at the same time. So it kind of reduces uh, the amount of changes required to deploy whatever you're trying to, to deploy. Um, when do we really need to upgrade? Um, there's a few, you know, security fixes, critical bugs, obviously those are important. Um, these are generally smaller fixes, you hope, uh, so they're easier to test and, you know, once they've been tested, uh, deploy when they're ready. Uh, new features are also important. You know, make sure to thoroughly test and take your time because, you know, if it's not a security vulnerability or something critical, uh, you know, take your time, test it, make sure it works. And, you know, if that means a deadline might slip, um, you know, deadlines are important, but your PM probably has a contingency plan, right? Hopefully. Um, we all make mistakes. Uh, testing before it's too late is key, but so is keeping it simple. Um, so what does your deployment process look like? Uh, I don't know how many of you are familiar with Gitflow. It's a semi-common Git development process. Um, over on the left is the keep it simple, stupid development process, which is what the GitHub kind of development process looks like. Um, so what does yours look like? How hard is it to deploy your changes? Um, there needs to be some rigidity here because you want to be able to test easily you want to be able to know when things are ready, and you want to be able to easily move from dev to production in a way that doesn't involve too much where your development process is the cause of unplanned downtime and outages and bugs in production because you forgot to merge the right branch or you merged the wrong thing or you didn't commit the right thing. You know, just having a simple process helps keep the human error out of things. So what do you really need? Uh, well, it kind of depends. Uh, for Drupal, Drush is your friend. Um, Drush is a great example of an ops tool that works for both development and deployment. Um, you know, web apps are wild beasts, and there are many ways to deploy and maintain web applications. Uh, it's really a talk of its own. Actually, how Oregon State University manages large-scale Drupal is a talk about that, and it just happened. So if you were there, um, that was a talk about exactly this. Um, so just kind of to touch on this, Drush is, you know, a great tool for kind of testing your changes, getting things ready, knowing um, you know, you can test the latest version of Drupal easily. Uh, there are commands like uh, run server and QD to download a quick copy of the latest core version of Drupal um, to run the server without having to have Apache installed on whatever you're, you're testing on. Um, being able to rsync files from production to staging, being able to copy your production uh, database to your laptop or your development environment or whatever it may be. Uh, Drush is extremely handy for your deployment process. Um, and finally, testing. Um, I already talked a lot about testing, um, so you know it's important. Uh, it's kind of a necessary evil, and it's, it can be tedious, uh, but continuous testing, you know, makes things easier. So, you know, Drush has uh, commands that will run Drupal simple tests to test your code if you're doing Drupal modules or themes or whatever that have simple tests in them. Um, and a tool like Jenkins uh, Continuous Integration helps you sort of continuously test those things and it will notify you when, you know, there are bugs in your dev branch that Jenkins is testing with Drush and Simple Test uh, and you've broken something. So t having to kind of take that away and automate it so that you don't have to remember to always run it, you just know, okay, Jenkins passed the test um, so my software is ready to go into staging or to go into the uh, full development environment. Um, and when you fix a bug, you know, this is true for anything, write a test for it so you don't hit that bug again. Um, you never know when some change that you make uh, brings that bug back up and you forgot to write the test and you, you don't remember, or you remember and you're like, oh shoot, <laughs> forgot to write that test. Uh, so, you know, have that ready, use the continuous integration, and on the ops side, you know, we should test our infrastructure too. Um, you know, you can write system tests, uh, behavior-driven development type tests with Jenkins, um, things to test if your web server is starting HTTPD or Nginx or whatever your HTTP server is properly and running and serving Drupal. Um, that could be a, a suite of tests that you have for your infrastructure. Or does my database server start my SQL with a working Drupal database? Um, is the web server able to connect to it? Uh, tests like that uh, we can do on the ops side too. And so once you have your deployment process defined and respected, by everyone in your in your organization, um, it's time to go from the development to production. And with that, uh, 
Greg's coming up to talk about going from dev to production. First, I had no idea I was going to be on a game show today. That's a little different, so I, <laughs> I hope the price is right. Um, so, yeah, um, you know, once you got your code written, and actually even before you write your code, you know, as Ken and, and Rudy talked about, um, knowing what your in-production environment looks like and doing things to replicate it as close as you can um, makes life a lot easier both for you and for the systems people, or if you are the systems people, you, you make, making life easier for yourself. Um, some of the things you'll note is that um, development environments very often are small systems. Usually everything's running on one system, so your database server, your Apache server, um, all that stuff is running on the same machine and it's probably on a VPS somewhere or it's running on, say, your laptop, something like that. So very often um, some assumptions happen there because of that when you're building a tool that might not map very well to a production environment where you are running, say, a load balancer with cache servers in front of it, multiple web heads, um, maybe having um, some different internal caching, um, things like a database cluster rather than a single database server on the back end, and also things like network storage. All of these things are places you can kind of trip up and end up with unexpected bugs or issues or performance problems. So um, the more you can be aware of, oh gosh, this is what the environment I'm going into looks like, and the more that you can try to replicate that, especially in your development process, your life gets a lot easier down the road and you spend a lot less time putting out fires at the, at the end stages of a project when you're getting ready to, you know, the deadline's coming up, the PM's on your case to get things deployed and done, and you run into an issue where, oh gosh, this thing's not rendering properly because all of a sudden it's pulling a session from the wrong, wrong cache server or something like that. So keeping track of where your infrastructure looks like early on in the project makes your life a lot easier down the road. So some of the things that um, aren't necessarily obvious um, that I'd like to highlight um, uh, to keep you from uh, falling off that cliff is um, be agnostic about the underlying systems. Don't assume you're running Apache. Don't assume that you're running MySQL. Don't assume that you're running on local host for your database. Because what's going to end up happening is you're going to write something in there and then oh gosh, this is getting deployed and the, and the, and the box is running Nginx. Or um, this, you know, oh, we're using Postgres on our back end or our SQL server. Uh, suddenly, you may have code in there that is com going to completely blow up when you try to push it into production. Um, the other thing is, there are a lot of performance en enhancements and, and opportunities here where if you write it into your code ahead of time, your code's going to work a lot better at scale. Things like taking advantage of slave databases. So you're you know, doing a split read write where you have a master database for all the writes, but if you then offload all your reads over to a slave database, you're going to you know, spread your load over the database cluster. Your reads are going to get a lot faster. Um, so uh, when your application gets big, you get slash dotted. You're OK, because you've, you've already built that performance into the system. That's also especially true when you're dealing with cache servers. Um, it's very, very common. It's almost, it's, it's hard to find large scale systems now that don't have some sort of load balancer or cache running in front of them. Um, and being aware of that, especially being aware of how you deal with cookies and sessions with those cache servers is very important because you can run into situations where if you're setting cookies, you're storing information in a cookie that really maybe should be stored in the database or in, um, some of the session variables. By storing that cookie, more often than not, you are invalidating the cache because the cache sees the cookie, says, oh, I can't cache this, passes it off to the back end, and you're increasing the load on the back end for what is probably static content. So you want to be really careful about what you do with those cookies. And if you're ever, it's, it's uncommon in the Drupal world, but you do see it occasionally, where you are manipulating the headers or you're setting expiry times. Those ca front end cache servers respect those expiry. So if you set a very short expiry on a static asset, the cache server is going to respect that and it's going to keep querying that back end and increase the load on the back end servers maybe unnecessarily. So um, you know, be aware of that and be nice to your front end cache by giving it the information it needs. For items that do have a short lifespan, yeah, set a short expiry or even a zero expiry. Um, but for items that you know are static that aren't going to change or change very rarely, set as long an expiry as you can on those items and you will make your life a lot easier, especially down the road when the site's in production, load starts hitting it, and suddenly, oh gosh, you know, it, because it is so difficult to really reproduce and test using high concurrency real user traffic, 
you can do it, but it, it takes a lot of resources to, to simulate users. So by being ahead of the curve and expecting that sort of stuff and, and writing your code in such a way that you can allow those front end caches to take that traffic, you're gonna make life a lot easier on yourself down the road when, when load starts increasing so you don't have to spend a ton of money spinning up extra instances trying to support this traffic. Um, another key thing to note is especially when you're running multiple front ends, uh, sessions. Be really, really careful about that because more often than not on large scale systems, things like your session table is gonna be stored in something like memcache rather than the database because it's so much faster. But be careful on that because if those memcache instances are running local to the web heads and they're not shared, you could be in a situation where your session data gets stored in one web head, somebody hits the site again, but their session's not stored on the next web head they hit, they're gonna either be asked to re-authenticate or worse, lose their session entirely. So you, get, you end up with very confused users. So when you're, when you're working with that sort of thing, be aware of, of that sort of stuff and make sure that your ops people, when you're working with them, that they understand that you're using memcache or you're storing stuff in cache that needs to be shared across all the systems so that you're using a, a centralized shared cache infrastructure um, for things like your session variables, things like that. Um, the other thing that's important to note on that is that um, very often when you deploy to production, you may be sharing hardware with other systems. So set unique keys on those for those key value stores like memcache that are site specific. Because there's nothing worse than hitting a site, having the web server pull um, some session information out of the cache and pull it from the wrong site. Suddenly you have the theme registry from a completely different site you have a very, very broken site and a very unhappy user. So being aware of these things and when you're, when you're looking at how you're deploying your systems, these are some places where you can trip over them and um, end up with you know, probably an unhappy manager yelling at you. Talked a little bit about this, um, but uh, so when you're dealing with clusters again, another important place to look is things like the files directory, especially CSS and JavaScript caching if you're using the aggregation. Um, because if, a w if one hit web head generates that and it writes it to its files directory, somebody hits a different web head, th those aren't gonna line up properly. You need to make sure that those things like the aggregation, the, the, the user uploaded files, things like that, are on a shared file system that's accessible to all the web heads. Because if they're not, you're gonna run into situations where you have broken JavaScript, bro broken um, CSS and again, unhappy users. Um, and I hinted about this a little bit a minute ago also, but be aware that you're not probably not gonna be alone on a lot of these systems. So, you know, what happens when either, you know, 10,000 users hit that site all at once? Are you ready for it? You know, is, is your site, is, is your code using cache efficiently? Is it using slave databases? Is it you, you know, setting those headers properly so that the front end cache servers can actually serve that content and not overload your PHP web heads? Um, and at the same time, you wanna make sure that you're leveraging things like multi-site and things like that because what happens if um, you, know, you have a situation like OSU has where you have a thousand sites running on the infrastructure? You know, uh, and what happens when you start deploying more of those? Is that gonna be a problem? How do you reduce the overhead of either one, managing that, or two, even the overhead of things like your APC opcode cache. If you have 800 separate copies of Drupal, your opcode cache is gonna have to cache those all separately because it doesn't know they're the same. Where, so, you know, keeping track of that and understanding where your target environment is and understanding that sort of where, th where the bits and pieces are make your life a lot easier down the road and, and makes it much more likely to, especially under load, your site's not gonna fall flat on its face. Um, and then lastly, this is my own personal pet peeve I've run into I don't know how many times, um, and that is do not assume that you're running in your own Drupal instance, and you may be running in a multi-site environment. Don't use, don't hard code for sites all and sites default because as often as not, it's entirely possible you're running under sites slash something else. And so by assuming sites defaults, especially in themes, um, but also in modules, you're gonna run into problems because the, the folks actually deploying to operations are gonna have to go in there, find all those references and change them to point them where they really are or do some crazy sim linking or something like that. That makes them grumpy and then they don't like you very well and then they don't deploy your code as quickly as you want. Um, so you know, keep that in mind and be aware that 
check your expectations, check your assumptions at the door. Um, work closely with the people managing your infrastructure if you have other people doing it and understand what they're doing so that you can make their lives easier because then it's going to make your life easier. And this, you know, we wouldn't be, this wouldn't be a DrupalCon without the, the constant plea of don't hack core. I know it's really, really easy to just tweak this one little thing to make it all better. But when you're deploying, especially in large-scale environments uh, and in automated deployments and things like that, where you have systems that are automatically upgrading, um, automatically pulling down security updates and things like that, your, your hacks are going to get wiped out. Um, beside the fact that it's just bad practice anyway. So, you know, really do think of the kittens because you know, hacking core, while well, it is easy and, oh, it's just a small site and I'm just changing one line, it'll be fine. Yeah, it's going to come back and haunt you down the road. So I even though, you know, we th I don't know how many times we say it, say it again and again and again. Don't mess with core. Put everything over in site-specific directories for your themes, for your modules, all that sort of stuff because it will kill you down the road. And we wanted to leave plenty of time. We, we actually kind of moved kind of quickly, which is good uh, given all the problems. But we do have some time for questions. There's a microphone up here at the front. Um, so that we can actually hear you because it is awfully noisy in here. Um, so yeah, please come on up. Let's, uh, I'd love to hear your questions. Oh, we got opera now. How exciting. Didn't realize we are going to get an aria on top of everything else. <laughs> Many skills, singing, not one of them. Um, so your your uh, uh, talk about optimizing cache and headers and that sort of stuff, yes. and that's kind of from the developer's perspective. Yes. I'd like to kind of turn that around from the operations perspective. How do I make sure that my developers are kind of doing all that uh, so I don't kind of learn about those problems at the, the tail end? Sure. Um, that's a good question. Um, from my point of view, when, when I'm um, going through and looking at code I'm getting ready to deploy, you know, I, um, when I'm working with my front-end team and, and my developers, usually the first thing I do is I hit the site with Firebug enabled and look at the headers on the page. I want to see what's there. It'll be able to tell me really quickly, you know, so if I, I, I pull that up, I, I pull up the headers on, say, the CSS and JavaScripts and images requests, I can look at those and say, oh, gosh, there's a cache of zero. Or there's a cookie set on that. Um, I also generally have um, some debug headers I inject at the varnish level that um, tell you whether it's a cache hit or a cache miss and why it was a cache hit or a cache miss. And so all of those things are usually pretty easy to check. And so you just hit the site once or twice with Firebug. You can then see that. And, and that you can, you can do it in staging or in development long before it ever gets deployed to production so that you can flag it as a bug or an issue to kick it back to the development team if you have a separate development team. Um, the other thing I c you can do is, especially if you're running something like Varnish, um, use the, the, the log tools. And you know, tell it to you know, use a varnish log to watch the back end requests because there's a lot of information in there about what is going to the back end, why it's going to the back end, whether it was a cache miss or whether it was a hit for pass, something like that. Um, so between those two things, usually I have a pretty good idea within a few minutes of just hitting the site um, of where things might be able to be tweaked that you can flag for the developers. Hi, Mark Dorson from Martha Stewart. So. We have a number, of, we have a custom deployment tool that we use that takes the site offline when we mm -hmm. do our deployments, uh, which we're not very happy with. <laughs> um, we have a number of ways to mitigate the effect of this on our end users, but there are some parts of the site that it's hard to, you know, such as search mm -hmm. uh, with very unique queries uh, that haven't been cached previously, where it's still a huge pain point when the site has to come offline. So I was curious about if you have any strategies uh, for deployment of either mitigating or eliminating the need to take the site offline. I'm answering all the questions. I'm happy to do it, but if you guys have something, go for it. <laughs> um, there is one trick that I've used in the past, and uh, depending on how your site's structured, it may or may not work, but usually, at least for Drupal core upgrades, um, and most of the time the module upgrades, obviously test the upgrade first in like a test environment, but you can almost uh, guarantee that like the schema changes in the database that need to happen for the upgrade 
can happen before you actually upgrade Drupal core. So you can separate the database upgrade by you know linking, you know using your host file or some test site uh, to like the latest version of Drupal or with the latest modules installed. Run the database update on production, but leave the production site pointed at the older version of whatever you're running. And then when it's time to upgrade, um, you you don't have to run the DB update at, at that point. Um, you can just push your code into production uh, and reduce the time that it's offline uh, during the upgrade process. Another thing you can do you know, is just kind of related to that is especially if you're running multiple web heads behind a load balancer or something like that, take one of the web heads out of rotation, upgrade the code there, test it again, you know, run the DB updates, things like that, make sure it's working okay, put that back in rotation and then rolling update through the rest of them. Um, that, I mean, depending on the way your site is built, that may not be the best solution, but for a lot of sites that works quite well because generally you can kind of stage that. And so you, may, you might have a period of time when you're going through that rolling update where some users might get the old site, some users might get the new. Um, but Drupal is generally pretty good about backward compatibility on that. So both of you wouldn't be concerned about having, I mean, you both are kind of saying update the DB first, whether it's completely separate or mm -hmm. on a single web head. So you're not concerned with having a newer schema with the older code pointed towards it. As long as you test first, usually, you, I mean, you'll catch it if, if it breaks when you're testing. Um, but in my experience, it almost always is backward compatible, where like you're adding an index or you're adding an extra column or something like that that the module doesn't know about because you haven't actually updated it yet in production. So you can do that, and like what Greg said with multiple web heads, you know, take a few of them out of rotation, upgrade those, switch back, and do it on the fly. Uh, but definitely test that uh, through with Jenkins or with some other continuous integration first and make sure that it actually works like that. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, my name is Mike. I'm a systems administrator with Open Concept Consulting. I was looking a while back into uh, Vagrant and VirtualBox and I like the idea of virtualization and I like what you were saying about building a disposable system that m identically mirrors my production environment, and that's a really great idea. But when I was looking into it a few months ago, VirtualBox on my laptop ran like crap, and I just I couldn't get the performance out of it well, to, even, to even do development. You know? I know that they've made a lot of improvements on it. I know that the author has now support for VMware, okay. so if you want to use that, you can. Um, there's also plugins out there, so if you have a, for example, like an EWS account, you can spin up EC2 instances using Vagrant, um, so you don't have to do something local. So there's various options with Vagrant as far as I know. I haven't personally tried it outside of Vagrant or, or VirtualBox, but I know that there's a lot of options for that. So you might check that out. Another yeah, so maybe even just running it on a different system. Then. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, another thing um, to, to you can do is uh, the the disk I/O in VirtualBox is utterly horrible. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and and that and that will kill you. What we've discovered is if you actually because it, it has support for NFS mounts, mm. um, if you actually configure the Vagrant file to tell it to mount the web root as NFS, even though it's a local NFS mount, it's a tenfold increase in production and and performance. You're hosting the NFS mount from within the VirtualBox as well. Well, or um, from the no. Host system? Yeah. Basically, what ends up happening is it has your host machine. Offering it, it basically configures your host machine to offer up whatever directory your code is sitting in yeah, as okay. an NFS ma share that then the virtual box mounts. And it's vastly faster. Really? That's yeah. interesting. The one disadvantage to that is um, uh, it does require, at least on Mac and Linux, and mm. I'm, I haven't done it on Windows, so I'm not positive. Yeah. Um, it does require when you're spinning up the virtual box to, to provide a password for sudo, because it, it has a sudo up to export the share that then VirtualBox mounts. But you know that, that just means you can't um, blindly spin up boxes. You have, when you spin up a box, you have to type in a password. Well, that's okay. I think I've had problems with NFS on Mac OS in the past, but that's a, yeah. a whole yeah. other can of worms. So. Yeah. yeah, the, vir the, the, vi the VirtualBox share mechanism sucks with bandwidth, so I would not try to transfer a lot of files over it. You know, doing the NFS mount is definitely the way to go. That's an interesting plan. Cool. The other thing, um, just as a kind of a, as a follow-on to that, one of the things that I've done with my developers um, is we now ship a Vagrant file in the root of every repo. So every project, we create a Vagrant file that will spin up and mount the web root 
of the repo so that all of our developers have to do when we create it or even our front end folks, which is great. It makes, it, it, it's actually saved me a lot of headaches with my front end folks, is they're able to clone the repo, do Vagrant up, and immediately start working on the box locally would have to worry about without having to worry about any of that mess. And they're also working in an environment that's much closer to production. Cool. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Hi. Uh, can you speak to managing and testing and deploying configuration changes that live outside of Drupal root? Like if you have a my conf change that you want to test and escalate through mm -hmm. development and stage and production? Are you using configuration management? Uh, not particularly, no. <laughs> so that's kind of the, the key purpose of configuration management is to uh, give you kind of a, a central, well, in most cases, a central like Git repository where your configuration lives, uh, and then a tool like Puppet or Chef to take that configuration, depending on how you've templated it or you know put it in your configuration management, to deploy to, to places. And with a tool like that, it makes it very easy to, uh, say with Chef, spin up a virtual machine for testing and assign it the same role and recipe that you're using in production to test your change before you actually roll it out to production. So you, use, you can use configuration management to stage like your dev staging production environment to actually test configuration changes to your uh, core infrastructure before you push them to the production environment. Thanks. Hi there, uh, my name is Albert. I'm uh, from TP1 in Montreal. Um, I have a question about uh, what exactly should I ask of my ops people because they're like in a different building and I don't even know them and uh, it's often like I, 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 I ask them questions and I'm not exactly sure what to ask. Um, so if I understand you correctly, I'm, I, I use Jenkins to with Vagrant to set up a virtual machine which then puts on a LAMP stack with Drupal and tests that. Uh, so it would be the puppet file, which I would ask for my ops people to give me that and then use that to uh, populate my uh, virtual machine. Is that a good way? Quite of possibly, yeah. I mean, yeah, Vagrant definitely will support that nicely. Um, the other thing you can do is just even, you know, one, yeah, getting to know them personally, even if, you know, even and then specific questions aside, you know, sometimes putting a face with a name will help a lot. But I think even just getting a list of what the standard deployment environment looks like as far as versions. You know, what, uh, what distribution are they running? What package versions are they running? Um, how are they managing that? And just kind of, first of all, systems guys love having people ask us, well, how do you do that? <laughs> so, you know, just going in and asking them and, you know, what's your process look like? What can I do to make the process work better, f to fit better with you? Um, even if it's not a specific question, sometimes just starting with the, with the general question of what can we do to make this process easier for you? Um, will very often open up the discussion and get it going. But I think, yeah, one, if, if they can open up the paper, Puppet repo to you so that you can see what the Puppet configs look like, great. But even if just grabbing what packet versions and distro versions and things like that, that's usually a great place to start because then you can work that into your, your Jenkins and Vagrant install so that you're at least replicating somewhat closely to what they're doing. Yeah, and, and you know, if they're weary about giving you access to the Puppet repo, you can either ask for read-only access or say, can you just give me a VirtualBox VM that's set up like production using your, you know, your, your Puppet or whatever already done, and then we can use that as our base box and kind of replicate from there. That way you have something that's as close to production as possible. Hi, I'm Salim from WebEnable. Um, I want to know if you guys, like, what's... What components are you using in your stack? Uh, you mentioned Vagrant, you mentioned Cluster. How is the cluster set up? Uh, uh, does it scale, does it scale out, does it scale in, does it do it automatically? Where is it hosted uh, internally? But, you know, I, I mean, I've, how many developers you have? Do you guys use Gitflow? Now, that's a lot of questions. I don't know if you guys have like a starter guide for new developers or new sysadmins or new DevOps people that uh, that I can access, that we can access from your site, uh, that kind of walks us through <laughs> your uh, environment <laughs> and your components. Well, that would be really nice to have. Um, I don't think we have anything posted right now of kind of like a description of the stack, but we also have many different stacks that we're managing. Um, one I can talk about is the Oregon Virtual School District, um, and they are a K-12 hosting of Moodle and Drupal sites. And so we have a, a developed a hosting environment for them. And that is uh, you know, multi-tiered. Uh, there's a pair of load balancers in front uh, configured with the virtual IP. 
uh, with HA proxy doing SSL termination to uh, a dynamic number of web nodes on the back end. Uh, there's, I think, six right now that just kind of uh, handle requests, and those are using uh, Nginx and PHP NPM. Yeah. But uh, it's very specific to kind of the needs of this particular client of ours. And so uh, depending on what you need and what you're doing, you might not need Nginx and PHP FPM. You might go with Apache and mod PHP or something like that. But for this, uh, we're using Nginx and PHP FPM, uh, mostly for all the static content and static files that they have hosted. Um, and then on the database side, uh, we're running Percona 5.5 right. in a master-slave configuration with a virtual IP, but a very manual failover process because we don't want um, failure to happen and start, you know, split braining or s switching back and forth and losing student data because yeah. there is uh, student data in this database. Um, and so that's just one large database server with a large slave um, and split with just, you know, master slave uh, replication. And, and, and then as far as like replicating the files across in a clustered environment, we're using ClusterFS. ClusterFS, I was gonna say, yeah, yeah. Is it NFS or ClusterFS. And ClusterFS has worked really well. Um, it, in this environment, it's a little bit more complicated in that we have a, uh, a very standard kind of Drupal uh, GitHub Git repo that has the core Drupal for OrBSD hosted on it. Um, and that is replicated to the web nodes via Git. And so they're kept in sync with Git. And then the sites directories for these sites that are deployed are actually on ClusterFS. So there's a, a symlink out to ClusterFS for the sites, sites default, sites all, and the modules, themes, and files for the sites, and everything else is kept on the local file system. And, and what tools are you using um, to manage all this stuff? Is it just Shell? Chef um, <laughs> is in progress. Well, uh, I was going to say just a, just a Shell, you know, bash or something. Or just a lot of that is through Jenkins. So Jenkins is kind of the, the master controller for all of these web nodes and deploying and upgrading and, and all these things. So we've written some uh, Jenkins jobs to do the deployment um, when a certain branch is pushed to in Drupal for updates, it will deploy and get pull on all the sites and update those and then run through the process. And so there's the ability to test beforehand and uh, there's a staging environment set up and all these other things. And Jenkins is kind of like the, the mastermind behind that in addition to CF Engine and Chef for the configuration management part of the actual operating system and, and PHP and MySQL and all of those tools. And Rush. Oh, and Rush. And, and how many developers and sysadmins do you have? There's two sysadmins and one developer. Oh, geez. Full time. Okay. And then we and also have a, <laughs> we have a team of students. Uh, I think there's about 16 developers slash systems okay. students right now that we utilize, and they work up to 15 to 20 hours a week. Oh, not bad. Okay, cool. Thank you. You're welcome. Oh, yeah. I just, uh, just a word on our student developers uh, and learning how to know what to ask systems. Uh, it goes back to that. Uh, once you start trying to put things together, you will know what to ask because you'll know, you'll understand what it is you don't know. Uh, so what we do with our student developers, uh, we just plunge them into the code. We bring them in, we get them oriented on, on the systems, how they work, and we start assigning bugs. And they're plunged in the middle of the code base. I think it's similar with the system side. They're in the middle of the configuration management with tasks they have to do, and they learn how to do those tasks, and that's how they learn. So. That's uh, my advice for setting up uh, virtual boxes or in environments and learning the system and stuff. Just start doing it, and you'll figure it out. Yeah, I got one time for one more. So, uh, does Varnish provide visibility into which pages are cached, and um, how can a developer request Varnish to recache a certain set of pages? Okay. Um, the first question, not really. Um, I mean. I, Theoretically, there are ways. Um, probably the easiest way is actually just to request the page, and um, as long as the Varnish config is set to tell you, set a header on that, um, it'll tell you whether it's cached or not. Um, that's probably the simplest way, but that's um, a little bit brute force. Uh, the second half, though, is how does a developer tell a page, to, a Varnish to flush a page? Um, fortunately for Varnish, there is a very good Varnish module that's available for Drupal, um, but you can also do it manually in that there is a, um, a, a, a command line interface that you can connect to. That's a control port. You can send it a, a, a command and you can send um, basically a, a flush command with a regex de describing um, what page 
or group of pages you want to invalidate, and then we'll drop them out of cache, and then the next request that comes in, we'll load them directly from cache. Um, but the Varnish module is great. Um, it's rock solid stable um, and does a very good job. It's available for both Drupal 6 and Drupal 7. So, yeah. So it will cache pages that are um, for authenticated users as well? Or? It can, but it's generally not recommended. Um, for the most part, when you're dealing with authenticated users and Varnish Cache, what you're probably going to end up happening is all of your static assets, your images and your CSS and all that's going to get cached by Varnish, but the actual PHP page content is probably going to get passed to the back end. Um, there are some interesting tools like EdgeSide Includes, which Varnish supports and things like that, that you can get really uh, interesting and esoteric, um, where you can actually start caching authenticated user traffic. Um, there are also ways that you can do with the cookies and using um, and using the cookie as a cache hash. It w you can actually then, for maybe a shorter period of time, cache authenticated user content. But generally, you're going to end up with frustrated users because what will end up happening is they'll hit a, something that you know, like an edit a page. They submit the edited page and then it comes back cached, which means they're not going to see their edit. Um, so in the most part, you want to try to avoid caching authenticated users when possible. But there are ways to do it. What about if you just uh, load the dynamic content with Ajax? Yeah, um, possibly, depending on, uh, yeah, there are ways to do it. You probably have to watch for that in your Varnish config. Um, so you'll probably want to work with uh, your whoever's run managing the Varnish server because you're probably going to have to put some custom code in the Varnish config. But there are ways to do it. It gets interesting and com complicated, but it's possible, yeah. Thanks. All right, well, thanks for coming. Thanks for putting up all the hassles and the noise and uh, the echoes. So thanks for coming, everybody. Enjoy the keynote. And we'll be around all week. And we also have a presentation on Thursday about ORVSD if you want to check out what we're doing with that. Thanks.